Welcome to Six Pack Philosophy, where we take philosophy, mix it with beer, and apply it to the questions you deal with every day. Welcome to Six Pack Philosophy. I'm Anastasia here with Mike and John. And on this week's episode, we are discussing bringing back terrors from the past. Bringing back terrors from the past? Not election terrors, though, right? No, 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 no. Like gigantic animals that could eat you in one bite. Yeah, yeah. We're talking about. That aren't around anymore. We are talking about de extinction. Yeah, yeah. Or yeah. if you want to say it in a way that's not scary, sure. Yeah, yeah, I, I like your scary. <laughs> my, my, my thing was I had this, this image of you bringing back like, like, like terrible like politicians from the past. Yeah, oh. There you go. <laughs> I'm not sure how much worse they get, so uh, that's how we go. Yeah, that's how we go. So, what are we drinking today? We are drinking Fresh Tracks. From the Harpoon Brewery. Where is this again? Boston, Massachusetts. Boston, Massachusetts. This is the ugliest bottle I've ever seen. Yeah, it really is bad. It it looks, you know what it looks like? It looks like somebody made a beer in like the 70s. And and it has survived. (laughs) It's been in like a, a time capsule. And and has somehow made it to our show. Somehow. I was thinking this like this looks the way I draw. Like very elementary and it and, says and that it's bright, floral, and hoppy. A spring pale ale. So uh we shall see. It it it's got a uh I don't know, it kinda looks it looks like a de extinction beer. Yeah. Like something that you're bringing back from the past that died somewhere, right? <laughs> <laughs> sure. That, that was the goal when we got it. Yeah, that's what it was. That's yes. absolutely what it was. Totally. Hey, if y'all didn't see, we've got the uh, the, the mugs are in now, too. Oh, yeah. yeah. So yeah. We've, we've got our, our, our swag out there in the swag store. Hey, if somebody wanted to get this mug that I'm enjoying this coffee out of, what could they do? They can go to teespring.com slash stores slash six-pack philosophy. I really hate the way they do that. It might be better to go to Teespring and search six-pack philosophy. Um, and we have an entire store there where... You can go and check out our shirts, our mugs, uh, wall hangers. We we got a few different things in there. If there's the wall hanging back here, yep. uh, you know, all kinds of stuff. We're kind of swagged out over here. We are sw- yeah. swagged out. We should probably stop. Stop what? With the ridiculous amounts of swag on our video. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys, you you heard it from the mistress. She's in charge. No more swag. Nope. We're oh, canceling no, y'all, all y'all the. So, so, so go buy it now. We're kind no. of. Um, Go buy it now because Before because she's she, yeah she's yes. creating collectors items is what she's yes. doing. Sure, yeah, that's <coughs> what I'm doing. All right, so we are dealing with the uh, the question of can you bring animals back from extinction, and more importantly, should we bring animals back from extinction? Um, with, with with this episode, right? Yeah. yeah. So I mean, this is gonna be really short, maybe. But not really, and <laughs> uh, yeah, do what you wonder. I don't know. Yeah, so, that's true, right? Uh, d- yeah. Do whatever you want. Yeah, thank yeah. you guys so much for coming. <laughs> yeah, we've had fun, and we hope you have too. So, de extinction. De extinction is sometimes I-, I love this term, resurrection biology. <laughs> Uh, mm-hmm. it's one of the one of the terms that, that that's floating around there for it right now. Necromancy, ex- right? Uh, no, no, that that would be the magic of bringing back the dead. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's yeah. You know what? A lot of stuff that was considered magic at one point has now fallen into the realm of science as it's become better understood. The uh, that that's true. That that that's that's true. Let's talk about this this resurrection biology though. Uh, the definition of that is that this is the process of creating an organism which is either a member of or resembles an, an extinct species. I think that last part is going to be important to our yeah, discussion. Yeah, so. the, the resembles part uh, because you know there's some question as to whether you can really truly bring back an extinct species or if right. you're actually playing with biology so much that you're creating a, a new subspecies. Yeah, well, and, and you know, I, I think another question that we need to kind of play with in this is what is a species? I mean, it, it's not even clear to science where the, those lines are drawn. It's clearer when you talk about it in a snapshot of time, right? But when you talk about it over a long period of time, species change Where dramatically. Does it break? Yeah. Where does something become a new species? Yeah. And so a a you know, let's say a, a bison separated from a thousand years from another bison are like really different bison. And some species don't change as much, but but my point is yeah. you can have two pieces of the two animals of the same species that are 
completely different animals. Let, let, let's remember that that poodles started off as large fighting animals. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So that that tells Did you. Did not know that. Yes, they were actually designed for bear fighting originally. They were giant right. animals, and they've been bred down to these toy poodle things. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so let's talk about about what it would take to to. Uh, uh, to de-extinct something, something that is that that, that is gone. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's just there's there's nothing left of it. What are you going to do to do this? There's a there's a couple of ways you can do this. The uh, the way that, that that I when I first dug into this, the one that I really thought I was going to look at the most was cloning. Mm -hmm. You know, the idea of of going back and and, and finding uh, DNA remnants and uh, basically creating something that's already existed. Uh, that's probably not the direction that most of this is going to go. Right. Although, right. although it, it, it's possible, we have we have yeah. we are doing some cloning now. Mm -hmm. um, but but there, there's a lot of difficulties with it. A lot yeah. of the cloned animals are, are are not healthy. They're not living a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not of the standard that that, that that we would expect in nature. Uh, there's also a lot of limitations on it. For instance, if we're using cloning, the the animals that we can actually Clone uh, are, are are greatly limited because mm -hmm. DNA's half life is it you know it, it, it's it's hard to find uh, find good DNA. Viable. That's Isn't it? Yeah. That's viable. I, I've heard the number of five hundred years. I, I, I may be lying. Uh, on well, that. What I've found is uh, on the outside, as far back as you can go, if, if in perfect conditions, you could uh, you you could get something that was that that had uh, uh, that. It, 1.5 million is what they're saying now. Yeah, that's what I found. So you can go back to 1.5. So dinosaurs are out. Okay. Yeah. Dinosaurs. We're not going to have the T Rex back. But, you know, the, at least not through cloning. There's yeah. there's some other ideas out there that, that's interesting. But 1.5 million years is under ideal conditions. Yeah. So it may be that the number that I heard was under normal conditions. Yet if you freeze it or or do some little thing, you could make it last a lot longer. Yeah. Or it could be that I'm full of shit and 500 has nothing to do with anything. Yeah. Yeah. Who knows? Who knows? But the the cloning idea is this idea of of going in and actually getting the DNA and 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 bringing it back to life and Turning on certain genomes in there. So, uh, mm -hmm. you know, there, there's, there, there, I don't. I'm not a scientist. Mike's a history teacher. But going on and, and turning on and turning off characteristics, mm -hmm. and you can adjust things through this. Um, some of the things that, that that would lend itself well to this, um, and, and that they're actually actively right now trying to do, uh, they are trying to to clone the passenger pigeon, mm -hmm. which I find fascinating. Uh, this is this is the one that I that I absolutely was excited about when I first got looking at this uh, because I've, I you know being a history teacher I read all these old mm -hmm. old books and old diaries and they talk about the the passenger pigeon was the single most abundant bird in North America and they talk yeah, about the these, cheapest protein the cheapest protein yeah but they talk about these these uh, these clouds of them when they would go across the sky that were 13 14 miles long clouds of these these pigeons that would come in uh, and and you know they've been extinct since the very, very early 20th century. Yeah. The last one died, I think, in 1917, somewhere around there. Mm -hmm. uh, so, to me, this is something that would be fascinating. I was just going to say, like, they should make a children's cartoon that's like, you know, the last of the Mohicans, but it's the last of the carrier pigeons, and and they're 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 fighting. passenger pigeons. I'm Fast, sorry, sorry, passenger pigeons, and 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 their story. Sorry, their story just, was very sad. It, yeah. it, 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 it's interesting because this is one this is one animal that we can. Uh, we can almost exclusively say is extinct because of of, of man. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they were they were uh, seen as pests. They and were, frankly, I'm kind of terrified of 14 mile long clouds. Like we have flocks of grackles that when they land in your yard, your yard is just black. And I'll be sitting at my desk, which is feels right like in front a Hitchcock a movie. Yeah, and and I'll hear. <laughs> And whenever they like take off, that's and, actually the 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 correct, correct grammatical term is <laughs> how do you, How do you spell that? V <laughs> U U um. There's an umlaut in there somewhere, right? Yeah, and there a click. I heard, you know. <laughs> oh. And then, like when they take off and when they land, and it's kind of startling. And I can only imagine it. It when is it, that big. And 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 the reason they're gone, uh, they, they they had. Just abundant amounts of numbers, but there, there, there's some characteristics about them that did not lend them well to things. For instance, uh, for them to survive, they had to have a m massive amount of, of, of birds mm -hmm. uh, to do this because they had almost no defenses against their their uh, uh, their, their 
They're predators. They're enemies. Yeah. They're predators. So the way they would that they would uh, defend themselves is they would just mass up, and it, it, it allowed them to survive. Mm -hmm. Animals wouldn't mess with them because there were so many. So when you start to limit the number, they become very easy targets. The other thing is they're very particular about where they nest. Uh, and the types of trees that they like to nest at ha happen to also be the types of trees our early founders like to use for fence posts. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we kind of wiped out a lot of their, their nesting area. Uh, that had a big big effect on them. And they were cheap protein. They would they would come out and just throw throw nets over them and just shoot into the sky and, and drop them. And, <coughs> and you know th this was a source of, of sustenance for for, for early early Americans, but we yeah. wiped these birds out. You yeah, know, when you, you see the uh, fourteen mile long cloud of, of of carrier pigeons going over, that's not rain. The, yeah, I was yeah. gonna say the bird shit <laughs> rain that comes with that. Yeah. yeah. Well, and the thing about it is the way you describe, um, you know, they don't have defenses other than just being in massive numbers. Um, that just that description to me is of an animal that is ripe for extinction and i'm not saying that they deserved it or that we should have done the things that we did but i am saying that that sounds to me like an animal that is not going to survive um for for a significant period of time it, it, I it think also that its didn't... predators are going to adapt to that and start picking off ones from uh from the edges or we were their predators you know now you can make the argument that their natural predators and not humans would not have picked off so many to ex uh, cause them to go extinct. Yeah, but the, then again, the we've house seen, cat's not going to throw nets over them. Yeah, but on the other hand, we've seen <laughs> maybe in a few years they will. Well, I'm just, I, I think it's an odd distinction to say natural predators and not humans as if we are somehow predators well, without tools. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Um, predators in the wild. Um, but we, that's a whole other discussion to have. Um, but it seems like they they would be ripe for extinction anyway. It, 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 and that that is a, a real possibility. They were also uh, that they, they they were they were dangerous to an extent. They mm -hmm. talk about that there's there's these stories of them landing, and so many of them would land on trees that 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 the, the trees would would collapse under the weight of these these things, or, yeah. or branches would collapse off of them. So you you wonder about this kind of stuff. Well, what they've done is they've gone through with these passenger pigeons, and they have uh, they've gone through and gotten they, they've tried the cloning with the DNA where they've gone through and, and, and from the the last carrier pigeon died in a zoo and uh, it's been preserved in the Smithsonian and it's it's there and they've they've tried to bring it back. They've not been as effective with that as they have with going in to the DNA of its closest relatives. Um, and the closest relatives they have are the band-tailed pigeon or the rock pigeons, mm -hmm. and they go in there and and. With CRISPR, uh, I don't know if y'all read about this or not, but it's, it's a way of going in and editing DNA, mm -hmm, basically, right. and turning on and turning off some of these genomes. And they have had, they've created a situation where these band-tailed pigeons uh, are actually creating babies that are biologically passenger pigeons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we we, we kind of uh, twice have have glossed over the problems with cloning and. I, I do want to talk for just a little bit about what some of those problems are and the yeah. theories on them. Uh, I want to talk about the, uh, oh gosh, I feel horrible. The sheep that we cloned. When Annabelle. Lolly? Lolly? Dolly. 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 Dolly the sheep. <clears throat> Dolly the sheep actually lived a, a, a rather short life yeah. and developed a, a type of lung cancer that's actually fairly common among those types of sheep but is not common at the age at which it was contracted in Dolly. <clears throat> and we've seen similar situations, especially cancer-based ones, in these animals. And what I find fascinating is the theory on why that happens is that not only does your body have an age, but your DNA has an age. Mm -hmm. And whenever they're cloning these animals straight up from older animals they're not coming in with new dna they're coming in with aged dna yeah and their dna and they're so they're starting with the body of a newborn sheep but with a dna of a six-year-old sheep and their dna is actually what's killing them okay i i hadn't read that anywhere uh but 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 it's interesting to me how, how we, we go about doing this because whenever you do clone something you get all the 
you get the bad parts too. Mm-hmm. You know, you're not you're not just getting a, a a perfect creature. Who's to say what that animal uh, that you got the DNA from? What health problems they had? Right. Mm-hmm. You know, you're, you're you're bringing that stuff in too. But well, I want to. You get- don't know if if you're plucking the specimen of some extinct animal. You don't know if you are plucking the weakest of that species. You could you be know? getting Albert Einstein, or you could be getting Donald Trump. Yeah. Well, damn. You know, you, you, I mean, yeah. You, you, you got you to you yeah. think about this stuff. Uh, the, I want to get back oh. to this idea of the passenger pigeon because you, you could be getting Hillary Clinton, but she lost the election, so <laughs> twice. Yeah. I want to talk about this passenger pigeon a little bit more because I, I stated to you that, that they were able to create something that was biologically the same as 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 the passenger pigeon. It didn't live long, but. Uh, mm-hmm. The other thing that it did, though, is because of the the, the surrogate parents, uh, they were using a uh, a bantail pigeon as a surrogate parent of this. It didn't behave as a passenger pigeon. It behaved as a bantail pigeon. Yeah. So, are you really creating a uh, that old species, or are you just creating a bantail pigeon that looks different? Yeah, I actually have that here in my notes, and. One of the interesting problems we have when we we try and clone something, especially something really old, right? Giant sloths, whatever. We we have this anecdote, and it's kind of a strange thing if you really think about it. I don't want to go into, you know, kind of a philosophy discussion on this, but we will have a a dog or a rabbit or whatever, and we'll say, that dog thinks it's a cat. That horse thinks it's a cow. That rabbit thinks it's a dog. Whatever. Mm -hmm. And we all kind of have a common understanding of what that means. Yet, if we clone an older species that we don't have a good understanding of their behavior, imagine if, like, in the future, dogs were extinct, and somebody made a dog, and it went around meowing and go in the bathroom and litter boxes and all this, and they said, yeah, we know what dog. You, you know, and you go into the future, and you say, we know what dogs are. Yeah, that's a dog. He's like... That that's not a dog. That's yeah. like a cat dog weird yeah. thing. No, it's a dog. We we cloned it. No, that that's, that's the not, chimera. <laughs> that's not a dog. I know dog. And so, how would we ever know that we have brought that back? And if you have something that's like you said, biologically very similar, but behaviorally is not the same at all, have you really brought back the species? Yeah. No. Or do you have something else in costume? Yeah. yeah. Well, and and I find that interesting with the carrier pigeon specifically, um, because birds, uh, well, birds imprint. And that's something not, not isolated. I was going to say not entirely unique. Um, it's not isolated to, uh, to birds, but it is something that, that they do exhibit a lot of. And so I tend to wonder if it was behaving like a rock pigeon, was it? Bantailed pigeon. Bantailed yeah. pigeon. Um, if it was behaving like a bantailed pigeon, was that because that is who who it was around, um, or if is that because of some some other issue? Because I, I think you can say that it's still biologically. I mean, if you have a duck that imprints on a human, is it still a duck? I think it is still a duck. Um, it's just going to try to fuck people instead of other ducks. Yeah, if, if you've ever seen where... Those a baby- are the ducks at, at the college you go to, right? Yeah. Yeah, they're mean. If, if you've yeah. ever seen uh, baby ducks that see a person and follow them around, that is their imprinting. Yeah. And the part you don't see in those cute YouTube videos <laughs> is later on when they grow up and, and their genes kick on, they say it's time to mate. They think people are what they're supposed yes, to mate yes, with. Yes, yes. That, 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 that's, when, that's when baby becomes dinner. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> we just lost like we, all we lost, our vegan listeners. We, we our, ducks. Our, our ducks. The ducks, the ducks are, are not gone. listening anymore. Daffy They're, is gone. Yeah. All right. I want to go into another one here. Uh, the Pyrenean ibex. Um, this is another one that I found really interesting because it's a it's a fairly new uh, extinction. Mm-hmm. And you know this is a um, it, it's a European goat mm-hmm. that we can find pictures of well back into into cave drawings. Uh, and right up into the modern era, these were these were uh, everywhere, particularly right. in Spain and Port- Iberian Peninsula. Um, but they have just they have gone extinct largely because of of, of people moving into their their areas. Uh, 
But in 2003, they were able to take cultures from this, from, from the last living Pyrenean Ibex, uh, take it and, and put it, put these cultures into a another goat's uh, infertile egg, remove the nuclei, dropped it in here, and they had an, an Ibex born mm -hmm. uh, that, that, that lived very briefly. But it, it shows that there's something there that, that that could happen. It's another one that I think is interesting because because it is such a recent extinction. I think it's something that that that, that maybe um, could could work mm -hmm. more, more than some of the, the older extinctions. Um, the one everybody's excited about though is the woolly mammoth. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, because surprisingly, the, there there is a surprising amount of frozen woolly mammoths. Uh, up in, in, in particularly in Siberia, right? Uh, in, uh, up in Russia, they have found just. I'm not going to say say it say tons, but they have found dozens of of these woolly mammoths that are that are frozen in this in right. this tundra. If you find one woolly mammoth, have you found tons of woolly mammoth? I just I don't <laughs> I don't know how that works. It's a good point. That's yeah. a good point. But there's a team of of Russian and South Korean scientists right now that are trying to bring back the woolly mammoth. And they're trying to bring it back from DNA from one of these these, these frozen uh, um, uh, mammoths that were there. And the thought here is that that they would take this DNA, they would uh, they would imprint it into into the egg of an Asian elephant and let the Asian elephant carry it to term. Uh, as of right now, it, it's not been effective. But they haven't gotten to that point yet. But they have made many and many of their benchmarks. They made all of their benchmarks so far, and they. It, they are predicting now. This is these are scientists that are that are being paid to, to do this, but they're predicting within the decade to have a woolly mammoth, to to, to be able to to, to 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 have one. What do you think about that idea? That's amazing to me. Yeah, I mean, I think it is amazing, and I think there's a lot of ethical issues that need to be discussed. However, uh, from a, a pragmatic standpoint. Even if I looked and analyzed these issues and thought, ethically, this is the most horrible thing. Well, maybe not the most horrible thing. I do have limits. It's not Hitler. Mm -hmm. But if I think, ethically, this is a bad thing, and then someone's like, hey, I want to go pay $5 to go to the zoo and see the woolly mammoth. I'm like, fuck yeah, I want to go yeah, pay, yeah. pay $5 to <laughs> see the woolly mammoth. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, and I would support it. Yeah. it. Indirectly, I would be like, they shouldn't do that. But that's a cool little woolly mammoth. And so oh, I would I end up... I touch it. Yeah. I would be supporting it with my dollars. So I think... You know, there may be those with stronger moral conviction than me that would just like, I'm never going to go look at a woolly mammoth. Uh, but I think there are also a lot with, with less moral conviction than me. And I think uh, overall that this is doomed to happen for good or bad. Yeah, yeah. And I want to get in, I want to get in the ethics of it a little bit later on. But but I just want to touch on something that, that, that that's interesting to me here is that they're taking this species – and they're imprinting it. They're, they're taking it and, and putting the the egg, the plant is into an Asian elephant, which is also already an endangered species. Mm -hmm. So you know, are you, you you've got two endangered? There's something about that that feels a little bit uh, bit dodgy to me. I just I, mm. and so so keep that in the back of your mind as we're going through this. Okay. Uh, so we talked about cloning, which is is you know kind of the the exciting side of it, the side that I thought we were gonna. Have the, the the most. It's it's the the most scientifically glamorous yeah. one. Yeah. But the one where where it seems to be the most effective is what we've always done. It's selective breeding. Mm -hmm. That's the second way we can do this. Excuse me. Uh, this is the intentional mating of two animals with the intention to produce offspring with desirable characteristics or for the elimination of a trait. Mm -hmm. So what you do here with selective breeding is you find the closest living relative. To whatever animal is extinct, and you breed it with another another animal that has those characteristics, and you try and bring back those characteristics. And over a period of time, the thought is that you can recreate an animal that has 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 become extinct. Um, the ethical question with this one is: Are again, are you create recreating an animal, or are you just going through the evolutionary process to create? A new animal. Yeah, well, and, and we see, uh, for instance, uh, coevolutions all the time. I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, there are legless lizards. The glass lizard is an example. This lizard, if you saw it slithering by you, you would say snake, not a snake. 
doesn't have the fangs, doesn't have the detachable jaw. Um, it's it's waste excretionary. I forget what the term is on them. I, clo, clo, anyway, um, is about halfway up what you would call its body, and the rest is just tail. And if you break off that tail, it regrows. Whereas with a snake, the waste excretion area is near the end. Their tail is, you know, maybe an inch long on the actual snake. Um, they don't tend to have venom. That they, they tend to eat different things. But these things look exactly like a snake at first glance. There's there's also some differences with their eyes. Anyway, point is, all that to say this. The legless lizards, you have to go pretty far back. They're, snakes evolve from lizards. Yeah. But the legless lizards didn't evolve from the same lineage that snakes did. Yeah. So that was two different paths under which you got these very similar creatures, at least from appearance. So, that was natural selection. Yeah. Uh, we weren't breeding that into them. That just happened. So, would you say if, you know, snakes completely, like, vanish off the earth, and then you made this legless lizard, which is, looks very similar, would you then get the pat on the back saying, we brought the snake back by doing that? Because now when they're both alive, we don't consider that. We don't look at it that way, you know? Yeah, yeah. I, I, if, if you wanted something that's maybe a little uh, more shocking to you, uh, chimpanzees and people, could you imagine going back to trying, you know, if, if you're an evolutionist that, that, that believes that, that, that all primates came from a common ancestor, could you take a chimpanzee and de-evolve it, it back, de-evolve it back and then evolve it into a, a, a human, you know, that yeah. same kind of concept. At, at some point when we get on... A, when we get to ethics, I do want to talk about Neanderthals. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Neanderthal and, and Cro-Magnon. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Uh, two two big examples of, of selective breeding, uh, and, and we know this works. We know that you can that, that you can selectively breed for characteristics. If you own a house pet, you know this. Yeah. Uh, you know, your 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 dogs did not start off like that. They started off as. Uh, as a wolf-like species, and, yeah. and things have changed. Your your cat started off much larger than the little creature that that that, annoy, that ignores you in your home. Uh, if you made an active decision about who it is that you chose to have offspring with, you partook in selective breeding. Yeah, uh, well, if 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 you if you did that with the intention of creating something that was uh, different, yes. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't see it that way, and I'll tell you why. I think you, you, you partook in sex, but if you if you did it for the intention of, you know, uh, this person is a large person, and he's healthy, and, and I'm a large and healthy, and I want to create a large, healthy child, then yes, you did. Yeah, well, uh, if you wanted ginger. I, yeah. I, I don't even think under those circumstances, I think animals make very similar decisions. I, I have weird problems. I, I think natural selection versus unnatural selection is a very gray area that doesn't get given enough credit but beyond that i think for sure to call it unnatural selection we have to look at us breeding other species it's a force them yeah yeah i, I don't think us uh, carrying out our breeding tendencies well, but, can be considered okay, but, but okay then let's put it at another level how about when uh the prussians or later the nazis uh went through and, and they, they found the largest women they could find and bred them with their largest soldiers to create super soldiers. That's yeah. selective breeding. Yeah, I would say yeah. so because an organization, the government there, um, is force breeding other humans. And so with that, I, I, I do agree. Uh, so I would say outside of force breeding, yeah, yeah. you know. Forced sterilization. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Eugenics. Yeah. yeah. All right, two two big 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 examples. The first is the Aurochs, A U R O C H S. Uh, the Aurochs are the native cattle of Eurasia. They're the bison of of, of, right. of, of Europe and Asia. Uh, and again, we we can see pictures of these dating back to cave drawings. Mm -hmm. We see them at the at the famous caves in France. There, right. There's pictures of these Aurochs, beautiful majestic animals. If you want to see what they look like, they very slim rear ends, uh, large chests, uh, the horns almost goat like as they came out. Uh, but uh, th these were everywhere. But the last, the last known one died in 1627. They've been gone since six, which is it's fairly recent yeah. in, 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 in this kind of time. Um, there's a lot of fragments of them in, in, in museums. We know what they looked like. Um, well, researchers have gone through with modern European cattle, and they've looked at it, and they found uh, large amounts uh, of, of, 
of Ulrich DNA in these, these animals. Mm -hmm. And what they have done is they've gone through and, again, selectively bred, and they have created an animal that is similar to it. They weren't back to something they can call an Ulrich. They're not there. But they're taking the animal back to this. Uh, and each passing generation seems to get closer to this ancient beast. Uh, this seems to be working. This seems to be a, a, something that, that is effective and efficient um, and, and sustainable. Mm -hmm. um, here's the problem with it. Uh, one, in, if you take these and they've tried it, they've, they've, they've taken these and they've put this uh, you know, bred back to something a little closer and they've released it in, into the wild populations because there are still wild cattle in this part of the world. They'll release it out here into this, particularly like around Mongolia. And within about two generations, they revert back to whatever the modern is because mm -hmm. that that's what that's what breeds. Yeah, uh, there, which makes me wonder. When I read this, I, I got thinking: Is this something that is sustainable outside of a laboratory? Yeah, I, th I think you would have to hit if you could get it there, and we got through the hurdles of what is a species in in a in a, a time instance after we got there i think you would have to have some kind of critical mass and yeah. it would have to be advantageous for that to still survive today yeah, yeah. i mean we can look at the condor and i think if we could um and i, I want to say they took it from like 22 to over 600 now um in you know a matter of a couple of decades but um you know i think you would have to have a concerted effort to breed a certain number of these release them once you once you have a couple of generations going um get some that you can release into the wild by then you know if you start with 20 you'll have call it 80 more um release them into the wild and then I think with that you stand a chance yeah but that that's not even an example of of reversing evolution that's just that's just getting an extant species to survive. No, I understand that. But I'm saying that you're talking about this uh, Oryx. And yeah. I'm saying I think you have to, if you are going to attempt to bring that that a version of that species back, you can't just drop two or three in with a herd of you know, 200 modern-day cattle. Or that's exactly the problem that you're going to see. Um, and part of that is because they the species haven't differentiated enough um, because the species is actually is the only biologically defined level of taxonomy. And the definition is that they cannot interbreed. So they are still technically the same species if they're capable of interbreeding. Yeah. Um, interbreeding and producing fertile offspring. Fertile yeah, yeah, offspring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, thank you. Um but yeah, so they're capable of, of interbreeding and producing offspring. Um, so, I mean, they are still going to be the same species. I think you have to probably go through um, a few more generations of that. And with that, you have to have more than just a small handful to start with. I agree. I think, I, I think, I think the problem with, with this, this, this whole system is numbers. Yeah, I, it, um, I'm not, I think it might be doable i think it is and, and and i think a case like the auric is one that that maybe we can win with mm -hmm. um the other one is the quagga the quagga is a subspecies of zebra uh it it, it lasted way up into the 1880s um it, it was a a, a a loved species however it was hunted for for its its hide mm -hmm. it's, it had a, had a beautiful hide uh much uh it had the browner tints instead of the, the sharp black and white tints. Mm -hmm. And people loved this, and, and that, that's what ended up wiping it out. But the quagga has gone through, and they have been able to se sele selectively breed zebras and create something that is, in appearance, a quagga. Mm -hmm. well, but genetically, it does not match. Right. Well, and, and I think that's an interesting question here. So let's look at the quagga, where it was hunted for its hides. And, and I think there's some ethics that go into this question. Do we want the quagga back because of some higher value we have for thinking diversity is good or we, sh we owe it to the quagga to bring it back or whatever the moral argument you have? Or do we just want brown coats with zebra stripes and we don't really care the quagga's back. We just want something that'll give us those nice coats. Well, the other question is: is is that a is that a bad reason to want something back if it's a resource? Well, I, I, th I think there, there's a there's there's a moral question there, but if 
if we are veiling ourselves in morality by doing that, if we can take off that veil and say, yeah, we don't care if the quag is around, we just want, there's other ways to produce this yeah. kind of item, it, yeah. you know, I, I think is, is where I'm getting to. Whether it's right or not, I think is, is, is a different question, but do we need to do this to make the world better for humans, or is there a higher moral reason that we want the quagga to exist. Yeah, I, th yeah. I, I think that's an interesting way to look at things. Hey, I want to get into some arguments ethically now that we've we've looked at the <coughs> scientific side of it. Mm -hmm. But before we ethically argue whether or not it is uh, it's proper to devolve something, we should probably argue about what this beer is like. Because I just about finished mine. Me too. Oh. So, um, who wants to start this one? I can I can go ahead right. and start it. We are drinking Fresh Tracks by the Harpoon Brewery in Boston, Mass yep, Boston, Massachusetts. It is a six point two ABV. Um, and I'm going to tell you this: this beer surprisingly matches the design. On, on, on this <laughs> and, and I'm not even necessarily saying that in a bad way I know we came through and really hit the design But it's almost like trying Is there a good way to say that? To say what? That, 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 it, that it matches the uh, Well I think, there, I, th I think there is Because when we came through And said that like it's an old 70's Looking yeah. thing But when I tasted the beer I was like oh I get it now that is that design matches this beer so it it kind of took the design and turned it around where at first it was like it's ugly and then i was like no it's honest yeah it's honest to the I, beer i can see that i can see that um this is a pale ale um it is complex in the bitters yet there's not a lot past that However, it is a pale ale. It doesn't smack you with hops over the head. It, it does have a smooth transition in, uh, a little bit sharper transition out. Um, and the unfortunate part about this is it's immemorable. Uh, I would say that uh, the thing that's going to remind me the most if I ever see this packaging again, I'll, I'll recognize it. I'm like, oh yeah, I remember that beer. I don't think I'm going to be looking back a year from now and saying, oh yeah, there was that Fresh Tracks beer. Um, but it's not a bad beer. It, it doesn't taste bad. It's 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 a definite middle of the road beer. Um, I'm gonna give it a, a two seven. I think it's just above uh, uh, average, uh, but unremarkably so. Okay. Do you want to go next, or do you want me to? So I find this beer to be refreshing, um, and is exactly what I expected from something calling itself a spring pale ale um it it is hoppy but not overly so it's it's got a distinct green flavor mm -hmm. taste to it that is not attributable to the hops um god this is a y'all are gonna look at me like i'm crazy when i say this it's got a bright taste to no it. Uh, I agree yeah, yeah um, I, I can see that I think it would be absolutely fantastic at the park, um, you know, hanging out between uh, volleyball games or disc golf or, you know, whatever it is that you're doing out there, um, laid out on a on a blanket on the grass. I think it'd be nice. Yeah, yeah. I like it. With that, I'm going to give it a 2.9. 2.9? Really? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I think it's a good beer. I um, think it's a well-made pale ale. I, I am... I am completely shocked and surprised I, I i really thought you two would would have hit this beer uh a little harder um i like this beer too i think it's uh i, I think it's refreshing i think it's a good summer beer um on a hot day i think this would be uh be outstanding or or out at the lake i think this would be a good beer yeah. it's uh, a little heavier than i expect from like a summery Warm weather. It is, but it's smooth and it goes yeah, down it easy. Um, and it, it's not heavy by any means. It's just heavier than I expected. Yeah, yeah. I'll say that it, that 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 um, if I'm going to give it a hit, and, and I don't know that it's a hit because of the kind of beer. I think it's. I think it does what it's supposed to do, mm -hmm. but that there is no bell curve to this. It's to, to me, it just it hits you, and it's and it's just it's it's just there. 
but it but it doesn't hit you hard. It's just it's smooth all the way through. Uh, and I'd I'd like a little more flavor curve into it maybe. But again, that's not what it's trying to do. Mm-hmm. It's it's doing what it's trying to do. Um, I think it it hits the benchmark pretty easy for for what it what it is. Um, it's got an ugly ass bottle that oh, it my does. Goodness. Um, I'm gonna go two six. Two six. Two six. Uh, now now for the the all important questions. Uh, lawnmower beer, absolutely. I would, I, I would drink this on a lawnmower. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, as far as dates go, um, even though we didn't rate it really high, I'm going to say bring this one out early. Uh, first, you're going to get to learn a thing or two about uh, your the person that you're trying to date's taste in beer. Also, I think it's a fairly safe bet. I mean, if we look at our ratings here, we have a 2.6 to 2.9 spread. Uh, that that's a fairly like you know that's a respectable rating yeah. around here. Yeah, it, it's respectable, but but it, it, it's it's narrow. Yeah, it, yeah. There, there's not like these varying opinions all over the place. So I think that's a safe one, and you can kind of get a fill out. Uh, this is not the beer you want to like you know light light the candles, have the nice dinner, and impress with. But this is a nice safe starting beer. Yeah, no, but it is the one that you want to take out on a picnic in the springtime. Mm-hmm. You know, before it gets too hot with the nice little breeze and everything, this is this is what you take that on. Um, and if you do that, I think this gets you laid. If you, you know, light the candles and try to do this romantic thing, I think this is going to be disappointing. I would even say if you go visit a brewery, don't grab this <coughs> one. Uh, this one needs to be a, a takeout beer because there's so <coughs> usually if you're not if if this isn't the case, you're at a ship brewery. There's usually so many other better complex well, more exciting beers more exciting yeah. beers this is not this. an exciting beer it's yeah, just it's a not. good standard beer grab, you know, yeah grab this when you're going through the convenience store on your way to you know the lake or whatever yeah yeah so i i think it has the potential but it has to be used correctly yeah yeah if you uh if you want to know what it look what it looks like what you need to do is when you go to the store just look for the box that looks like a tampon box and you'll uh you'll, you'll, you'll be all set uh it looks <laughs> when was the last time you looked at a tampon box i don't know that's what it reminds me of it just looks like this Maybe bright from summer the day 70s <laughs> i'm from the 70s leave me alone <laughs> that all was right. the last time you looked at a tampon box <laughs> we got time to tell my tampon jokes <laughs> What? We yeah, have, yes, yes, okay. yes. T- tell the tampon. The, the, these these two brothers are walking to the general store, and uh, the 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 store owner's there, and and you know one's you know maybe ten, and the other one's uh, three, and and the ten year old walks up and puts a box of tampons on the on, on the counter and says, "I want to buy these." He goes, "Oh, okay." Get them for your sister? No. Oh, you getting them for your mother? No. Kind of gets confused. <laughs> An aunt? He goes, no. He goes, who are you getting these for, boy? He said, my little brother. He said, your, your little brother? Why are you getting tampons for your little brother? He says, well, it says there on the box, you can run, swim, and ride a bike in these. And he can't do none of those. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me that doesn't look like it should be on this box. You can run, <laughs> swim, or ride a bike with this. <laughs> I'm telling you. All right. She's over here shaking her head going, why am I on this show with these people? <laughs> Is this where you quit? Maybe. Yeah, maybe. All right, let's talk about about the the ethical arguments here for uh, for de evolution. And I wasn't really sure um, what you know what I was going to find in this as I went through. Mm-hmm. But I I did a deep dive in this stuff, and I found all kinds of interesting ideas. For instance, uh, let's, let's start off with the pro argument. Um, this guy George Church, who's a Harvard geneticist argues that the ethically correct thing to do for w- the world is to reintroduce the woolly mammoth. And his argument for this is where they live, uh, Siberia, uh, the, 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 the frozen Arctic, that, those areas, uh, that you could actually reverse the effects of global warming with this. And part of the, their argument, is, his argument is, part of the problem up there is that there is no large species up there anymore that breaks up the uh, the permafrost and allows sunlight to, to, to get to the, 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 the winter grasses that's there. And it's caused this area to freeze and become a, a, a desert, basically. And the idea is, is that once upon a time, the mammoths, they, they were a keystone species up there. And by moving through there, they broke all this stuff up and there was a much lusher environment in that area at that time period so ethically you could uh you you could help the environment by by doing this so i can think of a few reasons but i want to hear from his words uh 
Yeah. Why does having a lusher Siberia help global warming? Because it creates more oxygen because you have more vegetation there. Okay. Yeah. That, yeah. that was my, yeah. my initial yeah. thought, but yeah. I wanted to see if there was... No, that's he what he has, says. Okay. Yeah. And he talks, about, he talks about it also. Uh, they have the characteristic, or he believes, you know, we're guessing... But because their closest relative is the other, that they have the characteristic of felling dead dead trees and felling these things, and that would create a situation where where more light would get to this area and it could return to what it what it what it naturally was. Uh, without this keystone species there, it's become something. It's become a different environment. I found that to be an interesting argument, if nothing else. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is a biologist that's looking at this, going, uh, you know. There's a reason why this environment has changed, and the reason is not people because people aren't there for the most part. The right. reason is we took this this keystone species out. What do y'all think about yeah, that idea? We ever hunted them, didn't we? Uh, well, well, not we. Not, not we. we. They, it they, was they, you. Yeah, you yeah. were the person. Damn, uh, I am talented. Uh, yeah. They they were. We believe they were a victim of of a combination of of uh, overhunting and the fact that. Uh, Temperatures dropped and there wasn't enough vegetation to, for them to survive. Okay. So um, you know, it's they're they're a cold weather animal. Well, the, then there's a over. chicken and egg problem that we have to get over. Of how can they survive now without the vegetation? How can the vegetation survive yeah. without them? Well, yeah, and I that's think true. the answer is human involvement. Well, and and if if we're looking at that, well, the, the answer could also be uh, hitting that 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 right. Uh, quotient of, of mammoth to the environment. Mm -hmm. If you have a small group, does it does it does a small group help the environment enough to be able to sustain the growth? Will the environment improve fast enough to to help the growth? Yeah. Right. You know, if you dropped a thousand of them in there, I don't think it's good for the environment. But if you dropped a dozen in there, maybe it is. Mm. Yeah. Well, and and I think there's a, there's a cost question on that that I'm sure we're going to get into deeper later. Of okay. Let's say we have the technology to not only bring the woolly mammoth back, bring it back in, in a way that it lives whatever a woolly mammoth is supposed to live. Take this area back of Siberia, uh, get it to where the woolly mammoth can survive there, let it thrive, and then let this whole thing grow. What is the resource investment there versus the resource investment... Because the world is actually fine for us now. We're really worried about where it's going. I mean, if we could stop everything right now, the world would be fine for humans. But versus the resource investment and maintaining the species and environment we have now, like what is really the more cost-effective investment at this time? Well, you, I, I, under, I understand where you're coming from, but they're looking at, at, at the situation of we're returning something that naturally occurred in the environment. And his argument would be that returning something that naturally occurs has less probability of hurting the environment than us coming through and artificially introducing something. Does that make sense? Well, yeah, I, I agree. Well, this is artificially introducing yeah. something. I would well, argue it's artificially reintroducing. I think there's a difference between the two. But but I'm just talking about keeping things the way they are. So yeah. we're not introducing anything yeah. new under my, my argument. And I would also argue that reintroducing something that once existed uh, can be as detrimental as anything else we can do. Uh, take the anti-vaxxer movement and the fact that polio is getting reintroduced. Yeah. That's a living thing that was almost died yeah, out yeah. that is now coming back. Now tell me the, the environmental benefit of polio. Get you know? your fucking shots. Never yeah. mind. Yeah. Um, um, well, and then there are so many issues that we see with bringing back something like the woolly mammoth. Um, from the perspective of there was so much, not just the food that they ate, but so much that we've learned in recent years about our, uh, our coexistence with microorganisms and you have to imagine that the <coughs> difference between the microorganisms then and now um, is going to be significantly different for you know what it is that helped the woolly mammoth to stay healthy. In fact, I think that's that may very well be a huge part of the problem that we're having with cloning. Um, yeah, yeah, and and. Trying to bring back these species. You're, you're not bringing back something that's prepared to live in exactly. 2018. Yeah. I actually, um, after I said that whole thing about polio, I heard it. I heard our listeners' eyes roll. They said, John, 
You're talking about bringing back a disease versus an animal. Uh, and actually, uh, I, I want to say, so I want to chase a little rabbit here uh, and talk about it where bringing back a disease or something close to it is actually a good thing. And we're looking at doing it so it's not a black and white on yeah. bringing back a disease. So we've found an interesting thing where in recent history, we have seen a huge increase in autoimmune diseases, asthma, eczema, um, list goes on and on, autoimmune diseases, things where your body is attacking itself for some reason. And we have some tribes that have not been <coughs> modernized the way that, that most of humanity has, and they just don't have these things. I mean, in rare circumstances, but it is rare. And I can, I can say as somebody who, who has uh, uh, um, an autoimmune uh, uh, disease, similar to eczema, but not exactly, it, it's a pain. And they actually think they may have found a way to treat this by introducing non-terrible parasites like uh, flatworms and stuff into people. And the theory goes as this, because they've actually pulled parasites from pregnant women in these uh, uh, areas and started seeing these things develop in their children. That our own immune systems evolved under such strenuous condition having to fight these parasites all the time, that when you completely eliminate everything your body needs to fight, your immune system kind of gets bored and starts looking for other things to attack. And these autoimmune diseases are arising because our bodies are attacking ourselves because it has nothing else to do. So it's kind of like our military. Yeah. So when they get bored, they look for other things to attack. I, I, I am one of those guys. I mean, I so. know. Yeah. Just like, damn, Mike. But there's actually a movement to selectively pick <coughs> parasites that don't have horrible repercussions and introducing back into modern civilization, like ringworms and stuff. To prevent these other things that are developing from not having them. So again, kind of like when the military guys get yeah. out of the military and you reintroduce them back into society. I got yes. you. No, it's the same thing. It's the same concept. But but my point there being that reintroducing a disease is not a black and white of good yeah, and yeah. evil. And yeah. I think the same applies to animals. Yeah. You know, I, I got I got I got I know we're chasing a rabbit, but I yeah. got to tell you, when I got out of the Marine Corps, we actually had to go through these these classes where they uh, that they got us together and they. They, they put us in a room and kind of taught us how to get back into civilian society. Yeah. And I kid you not, there was a lesson in there where it was like, it's not okay to kill people. <laughs> it's not okay to kill people. This is, I, I just want to throw that out there because you, you were talking about this. How Remi long did that lesson go? It was, was actually surprisingly long. It's, it's not okay to kill people. R reminds me of, uh, of Guardians of the Galaxy at the very end. The, the little raccoon thing says, they say, okay, we'll, we'll let you off on these charges. But you're not allowed to steal anything and do this stuff. And the raccoon says, okay, but let me ask you a question. <laughs> what if someone else has something, but I want it more than them? And they said, no, you still can't take that. He goes, I don't think you're understanding. I want it more. That's that's the key here. I want it more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have no idea if it's more um, alarming, surprising, whatever the, or good. the descriptor there is that... The it's not okay to kill people lesson was longer than you would expect. Yeah. Like on the one hand, I think it should take like as long as it takes to say not cool to kill people. Yeah. Guys, don't do that. Um, on the other hand, like I'm glad they took the time well, to let, make sure that lesson sunk in. Let, let's remember that that we've spent we've spent years being trained that that. Bad guys, you kill them. You yeah. kill bad guys. That's your job is kill bad guys. Yeah, absolutely. Now we're going to put you out in society and there's a lot of bad guys out there, but you can't kill them. Yeah. You have to call other people and they'll kill them. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and that's why I... After, I'm, after a jury. You've lost your I'm license like to kill. That's why I'm here because on the other hand, there was years and years of <coughs> training to kill people. Yeah. yeah. And like... A four-hour course on <laughs> not cool anymore, guys. Don't, don't kill. Don't I kill. don't know which mm -hmm. is... Worse. Yeah. Uh, it, so, so, so that th this first big argument uh, back back to the, I use the example first, which is probably not the way I should have, but it's it's the idea of environmental responsibility. Mm -hmm. right. There is this pro argument that we should bring back uh, extinct species because it is good for the environment. And I use the woolly mammoth because it's shocking and it's something yeah. out there. But 
we've seen where it's worked. Mm -hmm. uh, Yellowstone is a great example. Uh, my wife and I try and go up to Yellowstone every few years and ride horse, horses. Yellowstone, that area, the the the, the people of that area had hunted the wolves to extinction. They, mm -hmm. There were none left. They went up to Canada. They got the got wolves. They brought them back. They reintroduced them, and the environment has thrived because of it. Now. They have to have a hunting season now because if they don't, they'll they'll, they'll damage the others. Mm -hmm. But it has been good for the environment. You're over there smiling about this. I'm just wondering if these are the wolves of dementia. <laughs> the wolves of dementia. <laughs> That's an inside yes, joke. Yes. <laughs> uh, you should tell that story one day on a hard shot. Um, so the in reintroduction of these wolves have changed the whole environment and everything has become healthier. And part of the reason was when they took the wolves out, they they had situations like uh, like rabbits and and, mm -hmm. and, and, and uh, rodents that were eating everything up and they were starving out the other animals. This was a keystone species. Yeah. Perhaps reintroducing something like the woolly mammoth or a better example, maybe the auric in, in, in Europe would be something that that would benefit the environment. Mm -hmm. This is a, a this is an ethical argument. It is. It's also a con argument against doing that, um, particularly for species that have been gone for long enough for the ecosystem to adjust. Yeah. Because new keystone species arrive um, because it, the the landscape changes. The interaction between um, between the flora and the fauna adapts, and introducing a new species into that would be much like the introduction of kudzu into the South. Well, yeah, and, yeah. and I, I had a, a question here in my notes of, <clears throat> is a species outside of its habitat really the same species? So, so let's imagine a horrible, uh, I think it was Kevin Costner. Anyway, Waterworld. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, terrible, horrible, terrible movie. Horrible movie. One anyway. of the biggest flops in history. Yep. But I, it was such a good concept, too. I don't know how they did so badly. Anyway, not, we're not talking about Waterworld. But imagine Waterworld here. And imagine dogs have gone extinct. And the Waterworld people are able to bring back dogs. And these dogs just live on water. I mean, they swim around. Is it sounds a, like seals. Yeah, but, but that's my question. Is a dog that constantly lives in water the same thing? Even if it's biologically the same thing. You would imagine it's behavior and it would quickly have to adapt whether it adapt to physical traits at least behavioral traits mm -hmm. that would allow it to be a water dog you know i mean is that the same thing as a dog we know mm -hmm. if it lives in a completely different habitat but, but but this isn't an example of that this is an example of bringing some, some something back into its habitat now if you're bringing something back from ten thousand years ago that's a different habitat yeah. mm -hmm. but what if you're bringing back something that, that went extinct in 1880? No, I mean, I completely agree. The, the question I'm getting to is where we have Yellowstone, I think we caught in time. Yeah. Yeah. But we've talked about this habitat changed so drastically because this animal was, yeah. was yeah. pulled away. Now we want to reintroduce it into this new habitat that has been created from its absence. Yeah. And now they're going to fuck is, it up for the other animals. Is yeah. that the same yeah. habitat? Yeah. That, yeah. That's a different ethical question. Yeah. yeah. The species of rhino that went extinct last year i think we could reasonably bring back introduce i don't i the ecosystem hasn't had enough time to adjust to that yeah um i, I think we could do that now i think there's a whole other question of should we do that mm -hmm. is it um <coughs> is it environmentally ethical to, to to play those games are we really the ones who should have the ability to make or should should be yes. making these decisions because the decisions that we've made we killed off the fucking carrier pigeons that was a great decision or not carrier yeah, it was, passenger pigeons probably a great decision I'm just saying I'm a lot yeah. happier now yeah you know um, we've killed off the rhinos we've killed off several species of elephants um, any number of things we have caused the extinction extinction or near extinction of numerous animals we've demonstrated an inability or we've demonstrated that we have a tendency toward make toward what could be perceived as some really shitty decisions and are we really going to trust that this decision is a good one now yeah i 
I, I, I come back to this idea of, of if not us, who? You know, the, the question is, sh should we be the ones that do this? Well, if we don't, who will? If, if anybody's going to do it, 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 do it, it has to be us. Now, the question right. can be, should anybody do it? And that's the question and I, I think that's ask. A, I think that's a, a legitimate question. Yeah. Um, well, when you're a species so powerful that, that watering your lawn can be the death of a colony of ants. And I, I know fuck that ants. yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. yeah, fuck ants, especially well, fire ants in just Texas. Just fire ants, just, just fire yeah. ants, yeah. But but I, I use that uh, the imagery from that from a very real thing. But even looking at much bigger animals that you wouldn't think our impact would be there, we do have that kind of power. Oh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. So our natural actions or inactions, everything we do at this point, is a decision, whether conscious or unconscious, yeah. toward the survival of the species. Yeah. So. I don't think the question is, should we wield this ability? We wield the ability without trying. This yeah. is an ability we necessarily wield. Should the we think about is, it before we do it? Yeah. Should we do it responsibly? <laughs> should we and consciously it, do it? Yeah. yeah. What, what does it mean to do it responsibly? Yeah. Yeah. I, I want to get into the cons in a minute, uh, and, and I think a lot of that that'll fall in there. But but let's look at these 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 pro arguments because you know that that first argument of environmental responsibility I think I think that's a strong argument I I I, I being somebody that's that's been on horseback out in the backcountry and seen the wolves in Yellowstone that's an argument that tugs at my heartstrings mm -hmm. not the best way to make an argument but it, it it makes sense to me the next one is perhaps the uh, it, it's the idea that that uh, uh, de extinction may actually benefit extant species mm -hmm. perhaps the the, the 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 information we learn in trying to bring back extinct species will help us to uh, uh to, to keep our extant species healthy for instance uh genome editing mm -hmm. could be used to to add genetic diversity into populations that don't have them oh absolutely because they're that that that's a big problem in, in some populations is that they are naturally not genetically diverse enough and and they're getting health problems mm -hmm. because of it would it be would it be ethical to come through and and use that technology to introduce something with a little more genetic diversity to, to go back and find something. Well, I'm, but th this gets back to everything's a decision, right? Mm -hmm. So by, okay, I'm a doctor and somebody has an illness and I have every ability to save their life. And I say, I just don't want to get involved in that kind of ethical quandary. I'm not going to do anything. But not doing anything is a decision once you have the power to do it, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Um, so, so, so this really gets into what, yes, we, we know we can save certain species. We know we can kill certain species. We're much better at the latter, actually. Um, I don't know that we are. I don't know that we are. I, I, I think I think it's more obvious, but I think we've been very effective and efficient in saving a lot of species. When I was a kid, the American alligator and the uh, the American eagle were both endangered species. Mm -hmm. They're both off the off the list now because yeah. of what we've done. Yeah. I think we're really good at saving species. Well, we just have, we're just we're just now deciding to do it. Yeah, yeah. But but historically, I think we've been better at destroying. But but yeah. I think today we're really good at saving species. Yeah, and but I think we, we we have to ask, and I think it has to be on an individual basis. The ethical question of should the species live? For instance, let's imagine there's a species that doesn't have genetic diversity that we can save, but we know. That if we give that species genetic diversity, it's going to make it healthier, and that healthier thing may kill three other species. And, and those kind of consequences are very difficult to predict. So I think we need to take individual case by case basis on the ethics of this species existing. Yeah. Well, like uh, uh, we didn't touch on it when we were talking about it earlier, but there's there's some evidence. I, I mentioned that dinosaurs are out, right? We, yeah. Because you can't go back and clone yeah. DNA. But what there are some people think they can do. You know, birds are living dinosaurs. They, they yeah. are. Mm -hmm. We know dinosaurs had feathers. We know that they were that, that their bone structure. They're birds. That's what happened. They got smaller and they, they they changed. But there are people that think that we can take chickens, modern birds, chicken being the example they, that they gave, and by turning on and turning off certain things, you could create a, a small dinosaur. You could create it if you wanted to. We've cre we have created chickens with tails. We can do this. And snouts and yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. This can happen. Is that ethically correct to do it, though? 
You know, that's that that that's the question you start start worrying about. Uh, and I think that there's different ethical questions for what you do in a lab or a zoo. I was about to, and what yeah. you put in the wild. I think yeah. those are two different ethical questions. Yeah, because I I think that that we do have to look at those separately because one of them is en masse and will have an impact on the greater environment, and one of them um, is nearly entirely for informational purposes. Specifically in the lab, zoo has some other purposes as well, um, and and I think do fall under some different ethical yeah questions. Yeah. The next one up, so we've done environmental responsibility. We've done the flagship for extant species. Mm -hmm. The third one is is the one that I think we're going to have the most interesting talk about is justice. Mm -hmm. and, and to me, this is a deontological argument. It's an argument from duty. And, and the argument here is that since man caused extinction in, in so many cases, is it not man's duty to undo the extinction it do are, are we not working from duty in, in in returning these species was it our duty to not cause their extinction? yeah I, I have to propose that the inverse argument let's say there's a species that like you said from genetic diversity uh was was dying out and we introduced a new gene to give it the genetic diversity it had and let's take out the it's hurting other things let's just generally look at it the way they are with the other if we then go to this argument of duty, do we have a duty to go kill that species since it was doomed to die anyway and we saved yeah. it? The argument that I've seen uh, struck me eerily similar to the slave reparations argument. Mm -hmm. It was this idea that that our ancestors uh, hunted these th th these animals into extinction. And now it is the duty it is our duty as the progeny of that, those that benefited from it, to go back and invest the money in order to to bring them back. Uh, that's that's a very similar argument to me to the reparations argument. Yeah, I, I think it also gets in, into cattle arguments because I can take a slight variation on the previous argument and say, let's not say kill it, let's kinda flip the duty. If we take the cow, who was kind of this dumb roaming animal. And we give it protection. We, we bring it under our, our cape of protection as humans and tools. Is it then okay that we, we've kind of turned them into cattle? Is it okay with the horrible conditions that chickens live under because we have guaranteed their species life? So by doing that, we've kind of, that's their, their debt to us. For, we saved for, you, now you owe us. Yeah, for, for doing that. And, and I think most people wouldn't accept that argument. I think most, I think this is like I jury think they accept it every day. <laughs> I, 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 I don't. Th I, th I don't think they'll intellectually accept it. Yeah, but, I, but, but but pragmatically, we accept that argument every day. But pragmatically, we also reject the it. other argument, right? Every time, every time we kill a species, we we and we've killed yeah, many. Yeah, we, we 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 reject that we have any duty to them. So so I mean, pragmatically, yeah. if you look at it, we're we're kind of playing both sides on the other. Sure, sure. On, on the inverse, I think it's a lot like jury our show on jury jury nullification, where we said. Oh yeah, this is a great idea because he's not really a bad guy, so let him go. And then we say, but this guy's an asshole and he didn't do anything, so can we can we lock him away? And it's like, oh shit, when you look at it that way, maybe this isn't such a good idea, you know? No, I'm all for locking up the assholes. Um, shit, I'm Are going you to really? jail. I'm going to jail. I was going to say. <laughs> yeah, you, you might want to reevaluate um, your positions I, there. I'm all for locking up the people that I think are assholes. There you go. <laughs> I need to and? stipulate that. Well, that's that. You got a point there too. Yeah. You're all for locking up the people you want locked up. There you go. That's there what it go. is. See? <laughs> Perfect. I should be king. Yes. Um, I would be a great king. I would be a loving king. Uh, <laughs> you have a crown now. I don't know what you put on my head, but it's I like a, it. A bottle cap. It's just a bottle cap? It's yes. a crown. Okay. So, uh, do, do we... Do we owe rights? Because I think that the next part of this argument with when you're arguing from justice... To, to say that animals have to have justice, you have to actually believe that animals have rights. You have yeah. to endow them with personhood. Yeah, yeah. And how so, far down the animal kingdom does that go? I mentioned polio. Yeah. Do you know? we owe rights to non-humans? Yeah. Uh, and I think that gets to the question that you wanted to get in there. Uh, because, you know, w w even the term non-humans is a tough tough term to, to come yeah. to. Because what happens whenever we decide to bring back Neanderthal or Cro-Magnon, and we're all carrying that DNA. Yeah, I actually heard 
uh, an argument on this with Neanderthals. Uh, actually, I, I want to give a shout out to all our racist listeners because there, there was oh, really. Yeah, I do. You I'm think gonna, we have many. We have racist. I listeners? hope not. But if if so, I want to give a shout out to them because there was this old eugenics argument that Neanderthal DNA was part of of why darker skinned people were dark skinned. Yes, and, yes, yes. And they were full humans. They've actually found Neanderthal DNA. It's in Europe. Yeah, yeah. Europeans yeah, have the yeah, Neanderthal yeah, DNA. Yeah. So shout out to you Neanderthals out yeah. there. Um, anyway. Assholes. Yes. Uh, but. Um, Not all Neanderthals are assholes. No, all racists are assholes. Yes, yes. all racists okay. are assholes. <laughs> yes. I want to make sure we're clear yeah. here. Yeah. And I hope we don't have many. If, if we do, uh, you know, I don't, you know, maybe you're not we'll, welcome, you know. Or, or or keep listening and maybe we'll change your mind. Yeah, hopefully. That's a good yeah. one. That's, That's yeah. a good one. Yeah. Okay, so you keep listening. Point. Yeah. Anyway, my point is, will they be regarded as full humans? And the argument he actually made was was actually a really uh, a cute argument. He said, will they be regarded as animals? Will they be regarded as humans? Maybe half humans? Maybe three-fifths humans? Oh, the yeah. three-fifths. Yeah. Had to a, get in there, yeah. A, where did that interesting number come from? Who knows? <laughs> it's just, uh, it's just a thing. Maybe you know? we could have a compromise or something there. Some kind, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is there any way we could write that into statute? Yeah. What, what, what would we call that? Um, Maybe a three fifths compromise. Three fifths compromise. Yes. 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 Okay. That, that, that makes sense. Yeah. Don't 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 shake your head over there. Um, so, but but I wonder about this because if you bring something back, do do they have do they have rights and protections? And now we're we're acting from justice. Yeah. Even if you argue that animals in the wild don't have don't don't have rights. That's because they exist outside of our meddling. That's right. But once we have taken something that has died out and brought it back and is our creation, are we then responsible for so, it? Well, I think that you have to consider we've – there are lots of extant species that we've determined that we have some sort of responsibility there is. to. Um, anything – that is being protected by a nature preserve. Anything in a zoo? Did you see the teacher? Uh, I saw it yesterday. Uh, uh, this is Sunday afternoon. We're recording this, and I saw it Saturday on Twitter. There was a teacher, I think it was in Massachusetts, who fed a puppy to a snapping turtle in front of her biology class. Why? Because she said it was natural, and she wanted them to see what it, what happens in, in nature. Uh, she's no longer teaching. Uh, she, she, she lost her job. I understand that it's but, natural, but we have, like, emotional connections to dogs, and I that mean, would be traumatizing. So is sex. Do you show them porn, too? I mean... It, it, I mean that's also a thing. Some, some have been fired for that, too. Well, there you so, go. Uh, I just thought so I'd share that story with you. the school district <laughs> no. Yeah. The, the, the other You're not supposed to. Yes. Oh the other question we, we had with these is, okay, let's say we make them and we give them some assemblance of rights or no assemblance of rights. Is their DNA patentable? Are they owned? Are they property? That's, that's an interesting question well, because... Patenting uh, DNA on plants. Yeah. We patent DNA on everything. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, there, there, there's animals that are patented. I've even them. heard that, and, and I, I can't confirm this, I don't want to start a scare... But that some of these, like, I don't want to name them because I don't know if they're one of them. But some but of these genetic mapping, yeah, twenty three and Me type science. That some of them, as part of the terms and conditions you sign, you sign over the patent rights to your DNA to them when you send them your DNA to to map. Oh, that would be scary. Well, and there's there's some truth to that for a lot of those, and a a significant part of it is interesting. I guess we don't have to get into the ethics of of genetic information. You no, know, we, we should probably do a do a hard shot on that at some point. We could do um, that. We'll do that instead. I'm okay. not doing it though. Okay. So, Are you volunteering to do the hard shot on on this? Not today. I'd like to get, <laughs> I, I'd like to get the numbers I, together. I was but trying we can to do I was trying one. to draw it out of you that you were going to I'll commit to do it. it. Okay. Yeah. So we have a commitment to that. We at need some to point. talk about the guy that got flew out to San Diego hundreds of times for what he was told was medical procedures. So they could steal his tissue and use it in, me in other medical things. Yeah. And the courts ruled in the the favor of the people Fucking taking terrifying. his DNA because it would impose too much of a burden on the medical uh, uh, place because this would be in, in, imposed another way. Yeah. What a jackass court. All right. Anyway. So we've dealt with, 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 with justice. The last two I want to talk about together. Excuse me. And that's the fact that uh, the idea of 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 wonder and, uh, and, and before we do that, yeah. I, I do want to pose one more question in justice. Okay. Yeah, and I think it helps you frame 
your thoughts around the question a lot better. I want to ask, because we're talking about the Neanderthal, what if a future advanced civilization, I'll give you a scenario, uh, humans leave the planet, some go to Mars, some go out of the galaxy, some stay on Earth, and they, they create three separate species of once humans. And they start a scientific project and they say, I want to know what our human ancestors were like. And they bring back you. You're born into a lab and you are the human of these advanced civilizations. My question is, what rights should you have and are you owned by your creators? That's pretty terrifying. That, that, that's pretty terrifying. Uh, I would say that I would have rights, but I'm speaking from a very Christian perspective in my mind. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, scientifically, I don't know what the argument would be. Yeah, I, I I would have some real dish. Well, it's just a it. dumb human. I mean, they just, haven't even figured out interstellar travel. He wouldn't have even been here if we hadn't have uh, had, you know. They still have two arms. They're they're so. Yeah. It's a very how do they God get argument. anything done? Yeah, yeah it, it but really they created is. you. I mean, you wouldn't have been there if they wouldn't have the creators wouldn't have yeah, made you. Yeah, it's, it's terrifying. It's terrifying. That should be a book. That should sure be a it book. Is. It should be a new book by Six Pack Philosophy. You gonna write that one too? No. Oh. Yes, she's writing a book. Yay. I'm already writing a book. I just here's another one. See, so see your one your, more your career career is taking off every week now. Every week. Yes. 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 We're, we're going to volunteer you're, you. You're going to be Asimov. Then he wrote Isaac, like a Isaac Asimov. He wrote like a whole bunch of books. He wrote a whole bunch of books. Yeah. I don't think I knew of like six. That know. he wrote. He wrote a bunch of books. Yeah. Okay, fine. I think he holds like. Records. I'd rather be Shakespeare. Can I be Shakespeare? No. No. Fuck you. All right. See, that's why. Um, but we can move on from justice. So, so let's talk about wonder and intellectual knowledge, and that's the fact that that is there a value to going through um, and, and and creating these these extinct species just for the ability to, to, to see them and be amazed by them and understand them and, and have the intellectual understanding the of it. The freak show I argument. Think that, well, I, I, I don't even know that it's a, it's a freak show argument as so much as just to be amazed by the world, to, to look at it. I, but I, but I, I see where you're coming from. Is there a value to that? And I think there is. I think there definitely is a value to, to uh, just having something that you can study. <coughs> I think so. And... and I think that's where the ethics diverges between made in a lab, made for a zoo, and released to the wild. Yeah. You know, on one, we're uh, using a very controlled environment to, to affect a very small portion of things. Uh, and the other one being we're basically affecting the world with our decisions. I, I see it very akin to the difference in getting drunk in your back pasture and driving around in your pasture drunk and driving around on the highway drunk. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, they're probably yeah. both bad decisions. Yeah, but don't give me a ticket in my pasture. Yeah, but if I'm in my pasture and I'm putting myself and my tree at risk, that's fine. If I'm on the highway and putting everybody at risk, I think we have a different ethical question I do too. here. I do too. Uh, I, I'll tell you, when I was studying this, I, I, I very much believed that the wonder argument and the intellectual argument were, were the ones that were going to win me over. Uh, be, because that you know, I'm, I'm a scholar and I like that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. But then I got thinking about it. What is the difference between bringing back the woolly mammoth and bringing back a uh, extremely virulent strain of the Black Death? Because I'm I'm, I'm wondering about it mm -hmm. and I want to study it. Oh yeah. What's the difference there? There really isn't a big difference. Is it in a lab or is it is it out in, in the? But yeah, but, but, but well, what we, we've done that. that. Issue, yeah. We've done that. We've yeah. done that with plenty of viruses to well, study them and try and make resistance to well, new ones. But, and, but we've done it with animals too. Yeah, you know the uh, y'all are too young the to remember fucking with, fire ants with the fire the killer bees. Oh yeah. Uh, in the seventies and eighties, there was a massive killer bee fear because that, that. By the way, that strain was invented in a in a lab in mm -hmm. I've forgotten in South America or Central America, and. Some of the bees got out, and they ended up breeding, and and they started wiping out populations. They that they they didn't. Uh, and they became a viable species. And they became a viable species, and and other species died out or started dying out because of it. Uh, and that was done in a lab situation. Mm -hmm. That wasn't done very well, but yeah, I'm I'm pretty and that's sure. That's the risk you always run. Yeah, I saw about a year and a half ago that there is a a new bee that it's it's a pest. It infests people's walls and, and makes some slight structural damage to their house, but they don't really attack people. They're they're pretty docile in their attack. 
But where they're finding interesting uses for this is they will kill killer bees. Hmm. So it's like, well, do we want to leave the bees there? Because now you're safe from killer bees. Mm -hmm. But they are infesting your walls and being a nuisance. So yeah. how do we... Can you imagine the buzzing? Like, if that's in your bedroom wall and you're just hearing... I would move. Oh, my God. Yeah. That would... Ah, ah, yeah. I would hate that. It's like living in a house with mice and it running around the walls. You, yeah. you just yeah. got to move. Yeah. Yeah. At a certain point, you go, fuck this place. Yeah. Uh, I have lived in those kind of rat holes before. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I may, I may be wrong on that, but I'm pretty sure about a year and a half ago I heard that story. I, That'd be interesting. I didn't research it for this, but yeah. 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 Let's talk about the cons a little bit. Uh, I, I think there's been some strong arguments for it. Let's look at the arguments against uh, uh, bringing back extinct species. First off, the, the, the first big argument, uh, and I think the strongest one is that it's a waste of resources that would have been better used to preserve uh extant species mm -hmm. why are we using this money to bring back species that are not that are probably not going to be viable yeah. probably because it's so expensive and so difficult to mm -hmm. bring something completely back why aren't we just using the same same stuff to uh um keep what we got keep what we have yeah yeah, yeah well, so, and go ahead so i think there's actually depending on what your reasoning is for wanting to bring these these species back I, I think there's probably a more resource efficient way to go about this, and it is to, um, so it is part partially selective breeding, or it's largely selective breeding, really, um, in that you take a look at a problem and you say, what is it that could fix this problem? If it's um, reintroducing the woolly mammoth to Siberia, what is it that you're um, that you are seeking to have happen there. You're seeking to have a very large um, animal roaming in herds around around this area, breaking up the permafrost and letting light seep into to what would be yeah. vegetation otherwise. So could we not then uh, start to selectively breed elephants for that purpose? And then you're not like they're not bringing... going to survive in that area. Not in the first few generations, yeah. um, but we have we have zoos established all over the world that are already engaging in these sorts of uh, not this specifically, but they're already gauging and engaging in um, in breeding for biodiversity um, for these different species that they have. They have complex matrices uh, to make sure that that they are getting the best in biodiversity and I think could easily transition into accommodating these species for different environments. I I, I think could be more resource efficient than I, things I, like I, I think you may be right. I read uh, in, in the Journal of Life Sciences, uh, uh, Journal of Life Sciences Society and Policy 2014, they said the cost of reviving a single species uh, would 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 go into the tens of millions of dollars to uh, one species. Well, I, and I want to make a, a, an argument that I think parallels this one from uh, the notorious NDT Neil deGrasse Tyson himself um, on hoop hoop. Yes, uh, I like on Tyson. this. What was that noise? That's the hoop that's, hoop that's, for that, the notorious that's my, NDT. That's yeah. my Tyson noise. Hoop yeah. hoop. Yeah. All Tysons get that effect. All Tysons. Just generally yeah, yeah, Tysons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Tyson Mike Meat. Sis Cicely Tyson, the yeah. actress. Mike all Tyson, those. the boxer. Yeah, yeah all of them. Oh. Okay. But Chicken. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, but <coughs> his argument was that there is this infatuation with colonizing and terraforming Mars. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he says, you know... We can't make that a focus because if we ever have the, the technology to terraform Mars, we have the technology to save Earth. We don't yeah. need, you know, to do that. Any, any trouble that Earth would face that going to Mars would help, we could just fix before it's a problem. Now, here's the rebut to that. While that's absolutely true, if we have the technology to truly terraform Mars, we could save Earth. The rebut is, but... but in the process of trying and failing to terraform Mars, we will be able to develop a lot of the technology and answer a lot of the questions that will then let us save Earth. Yeah. Just like nobody, when they were when they were 
going to space was like, and we can create this home appliance that'll let anybody cook lazily cook their food in five minutes. Right. Or Tang. But yeah. Tang, yes, Tang, the the great Tang. Um, but when I'll they be shitting on Tang now. When, when they did that, that was a by- byproduct out of that. Yeah. And by doing the science of respeciation, we have we will in fact answer the questions that will allow us to save the species we already have. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, the the second big big uh, anti we've already kind of talked on it is that the habitat necessary for these formerly extinct species is is almost always gone. Yeah. Uh, the, it, it's too limited to warrant the the the, the cost of the extinction. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a I think that's a incredibly strong argument. It uh, is. Uh, the passenger pigeon that we talked about earlier, I've got it, got it written on here. Uh, passenger pigeons produce only one viable egg, and they need hundreds of thousands of pigeons to stay a viable species. Yeah. So even if we could, could recreate the passenger pigeon, can we recreate it at the level that it would have to have to be viable? Yeah. Well, and, and I want to point out, you mentioned earlier cost and said, uh, what journal was it? Life science uh, or something. Yeah. Uh, um, but anyway, said that it would cost in the life sciences, society, and policy. Okay. Um, said that it would cost in the tens of millions. I think he said hundreds of millions. Tens of millions. Tens of millions. Ten, it would okay. cost in the tens of millions to bring back one species. But I suspect <coughs> what they're talking about there is only to bring one individual of that species back into existence and not the zoo scenario the, not the well, they're talking about a zoo but they're talking about a, a breedable sustainable series not a wild not not a wild species that's but, to bring back a breedable uh, laboratory okay, okay so then yeah. the, in that case we're not talking about and i guess that's where i want to go with this is that's that's to bring it back in the zoo scenario but to introduce one to the wild, you are looking at so many more expenses, yeah. having to um, adjust either adjust their genetics to fit the um, the habitat that exists, or find a habitat or change a habitat that would fit them, uh, and then all of the kind of the nursing and and monitoring that's going to go into making sure that this species does get to a point where it can survive in the wild without our well and, and let me involved. defend them a little bit because uh while um that cost gets rather high especially when you talk about more than just one species because there's a lot um there is a huge diminishing cost on further reproducing for instance it would cost a whole lot of money to bring back one woolly mammoth but i can make like thousands of chickens for like Nearly nothing, mm-hmm. yeah. Because you know, once it's established as a species, the cost starts to get really yeah. low. The, to fir- further- the first two is hard. The third one's a little cheaper. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah, and I get that. And I'm just I'm talking about getting it to the point that it can do. You've that. You've also got the point of 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 for it to be a survivable species. How many different. Uh, uh, animals you have to bring up in the laboratory mm-hmm. so you don't have have inbreeding. Exactly. You know you've got to find different DNA and create different, uh, or, or you'll you'll have a, a very unhealthy species that you've created. I'll be interested to see if we get to a point where we can synthetically create DNA um, and adjust. You know, have a, a set of alleles and just sort of randomize it's got to have all of these different traits but uh or the all of these different genes for this given species but randomize which alleles you're going to pick um to fit all of the the genetics that it's got to have and then um you know have an embryo of dozens of different bio uh biologically diverse species that can then be brought up I, I, I know i don't think our crispr technology is at a point where we could do that no yeah so i i, I see what you're but, saying but i i just i don't think it's something it's, we can do with current technology no we can't and that's what i'm saying is i i think it'll be really cool i don't think we're real far off from being able to actually do that um See, I don't know. I don't know. Because we talk about mapping genomes. And if, if a genome is sufficiently small enough, we can map a genome. And we're talking like bacteria. We can map a genome in a nice experiment. 
right? It, the experiment runs overnight. However, uh, with that said, when we talk about mapping, and we talked about this in a recent episode, when we talk about mapping the human genome, we've kind of mapped out what parts are kind of responsible for what, but if you, if I went to a lab, and I said, I want a data copy of my DNA, mm -hmm. every strand. First of all, that'd be really tough because the DNA in one cell and DNA in another yeah. cell are going to be different. But even if we could get over that hurdle somehow, that is a massive amount of data for one person's DNA. Yeah. And, and to be able to get 10 different individuals in the same species map out all their DNA, randomize and remix in a meaningful way, mm -hmm. I, I think the data management on that project alone will require some kind of, of dedicated yeah. supercomputing. But right that, now, right yeah. now it would. Yeah. yeah. Now, it, down and, the road, we don't know. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. that's what I'm saying is, no, we're not capable of that now, yeah. even from the computing side of it. Well, I um, am, but I don't know about the rest of you. We're not capable including mike <laughs> mike will be selling woolly mammoths on the teespring soon he yes. Yes. Yeah, yes. woolly mammoths will yeah. be available it's your own personal woolly mammoth we have but to find a way to make that happen I'm with the six-pack philosophy it. logo on the side we have to find a way to make that happen yeah hey, but anyway Anna, will you take charge of that no. <laughs> yeah. but anyway no we're not at that point yet but that's that's exactly what i'm saying is i'm i'm interested to see i think that is a point that we can get to um are you and, what's your question are you asking the cost on that or no Oh, you're just I'm saying, just saying yeah, how long would it would take? Cool. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm not even saying how, lo how long would it take. I'm saying I think that's a thing, I think a direction that we're heading, and I think that it's cool. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I was just making a comment. Just a comment. So I don't get the question. Could you? <laughs> All right. So the, the next section, I kind of want to talk about these kind of together because we've already addressed the idea that what you're creating is not truly a return species a lot of times, but a, mm -hmm. but, but, but a new species. A that, similar species. Yeah. If, oftentimes incredibly similar okay yeah. uh, the, the idea is uh, visually identical mm -hmm. in, in a lot of cases uh, but but they're not the same what is the effect of introducing what is essentially an alien species be, because it's not the same you're introducing an alien species into an ecosystem what ethically what are you doing to that ecosystem is that a, a con to doing this well and and, and here's the problem fire ants i mean they they went extinct for a reason yeah fire ants again we have no uh horny toads in texas anymore we got Hardly. some. We don't have a lot. We're we're starting to have more because when we're getting a, in control of the fire ant problem. When I was a kid, I used to catch them and play with them all the time down oh, in yeah. South Texas, and they, yeah. you know, uh, now you don't yeah. hardly ever see them. I have never seen a living horny toad in the wild in yeah. my life. Really? Ever. I can remember as a kid going out and and collecting boxes of them. You know, they were everywhere down down, oh, yeah. down in South Texas. I was a little shithead yeah. though. Uh, but the problem there is we we are incredibly. We have an incredibly bad track record of predicting the effects of that. And beyond that, uh, we are a little better now, but we're not really much better. And we kind of find ourselves, if any of, of you know, our, I guess our older listeners have watched Fantasia. Um, Great movie. You know, we, we're kind of Mickey Mouse, uh, the Sorcerer's Apprentice there. We found the magic book and we're playing with it, but we really don't know where don't the story is going. Yeah. We don't know what the hell those brooms are going to do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, I need to watch that again. I like barely remember it. You need to watch the Fantasia 2000, the re-release. It's got it because the soundtrack's cleaned up and it's a lot better sound. Really? Uh, all right. So, so, so related to this, let's talk about these alien species, and and let's look at some of the the, the times we have introduced alien species. Uh, if you're in the south, southern United States, uh, Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, uh, the Carolinas, even in parts of Texas and Louisiana, you know what kudzu is. Uh -huh. uh, it is impressive. It is. It and is kind of intimidating. It was it was released in the early 20th century as a ground cover uh, during the Dust Bowl in the 1930s as a way of keeping our 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 ground soil from from uh, blowing away, and it was supposed to be this this cure all. And today, it has wiped out millions of acres of of timber. Oh yeah. But, and this this is a you know it's an Asian uh, plant that was introduced. Kudzu yeah. um, grows uh, like in a, a foot. You can almost watch, you can watch it, it grow. grow. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Uh, uh, 
So that, you know, that's a plant, not an animal. So let's look right. at, at animals. The starling. I don't know if y'all are aware. Uh, if you're again, if you're from the south, you probably know what a starling is. It's the, uh, y'all aren't familiar with these. It's this really annoying bird uh, that, that that just it just makes a, a terrible amount of noise and shits everywhere. The star- Sounds like a bird. Uh, yeah, they're they're uh, they're really you see a lot of them in Georgia and Virginia okay. in that area, the Carolinas, but. Um, the starling was actually introduced by an English professor uh, into the United States. And this English professor believed that all the birds that were mentioned in Shakespeare's play should be available in the United States. So he tried to bring them all here. Did he manage to get the phoenix too? I didn't. <laughs> I wasn't sure. I don't actually know if it's mentioned. I don't think it's was, mentioned yeah. in the Shakespeare play. He needs but, to. But, but 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 the starling is, is is one of these birds that Shakespeare talks about. It's a native to the British Isles, mm-hmm. and it's become a massive pest uh, in 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 parts of the United States. <laughs> so we know the alien species could can can come in and and do some some real terror to things. Imagine, to humans, yeah. Well, well, not even not just humans. Uh, to, to to ecosystems. Uh, think about uh, uh, Australia. They introduced rabbits there because they had a, the, 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 you know, they, they had some uh, problems with with vegetation. The rabbits ended up eating up the vegetation. So what did they do? They went and got. Uh, got dogs in order to to kill the rabbits, and then they had a massive dog population. You know, th- th- this kind of thing happens. You can't introduce an alien species without affecting something. Yeah, the what nutria? happens? The nutria. Yeah. What happens when we introduce something the size of an elephant, the right. woolly mammoth? What happens when when we reintroduce the carrier pigeon or the yeah. passenger pigeon? What happens when we reintroduce the uh, the aurex? This. Yeah. I want the sloth back. Uh, the giant sloth, the one yes. that's the size of a, of a small of truck. Of an elephant, yeah. 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 Oh, no. I do not want I that. I just right. want one big enough to hug me. You know that the giant... That one's, that one's big enough to hug you. Don't worry oh, about no, it. I, no, that one's big enough to crush me. It is more than big <laughs> enough to hug you, yeah. The giant sloths kept the avocados around, and when they died out, humans have taken that over. The only Not in the same way, though. Yes. <laughs> the giant sloths used to pick the avocados and eat them... As like a grape or something, like just as a whole, digest them and poop out the giant pits. Yeah. And that's how they spread. They have no other way to spread. And the only reason they're still alive is because... Man is intervened. Man, yeah, man came through while the giant sloths were around. The giant sloths died out and they said, these are delicious fruits. We will continue to manually yeah. harvest them. Yeah, amazing. Because av- avocados are are amazing. Yes, I like them better better not through the poop shoot of a giant. Yeah, have you tried them? They are. I have not. Yeah, it's it's like the the coffee beans it's and a the whole new flavor. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. It's, it's it's the way to go. You know, if we could like poop I, shoot is the official term for that. I was way. wondering about that. Uh, <laughs> See, that's why I need to bring them back so we can have. Uh, I, I, I want to get back into this idea though, because the alien species. What happens if they if they act as disease vectors? Because we know that 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 that. Animals can do this. Yeah. Well, look, rats. Look, the bubonic plague. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and we can look at it the other way. For instance, let's say we bring back the woolly mammoth. Is it going to have the immunities to today's diseases that it needs to survive in our? Well, even if even if it can, even if it can't survive long term, its immunity could allow it to contract something and spread it that otherwise it wouldn't right. have. Right. Oh, yeah. I mean, we've seen that issue with um, you know we've you've heard about the uh, amphibians dying off. Yeah. Yeah, um, there's there's a theory out now that seems to be widely supported that the issue there was that a a specific species of frog that was that had an immunity to this particular disease got introduced somewhere else and it has just spread worldwide nearly, um, causing a mass die off of a lot of these species and and i think that's the sort of thing that i'm not the disease spread the frog spread i'm confused on that story sorry so it was a carrier of the disease but it wasn't affected by correct okay yeah um but i'm not saying that i am adamantly against us bringing back those species but I think that we need to slow our roll on it. People seem really, really eager to do it. I'm one of those. And <laughs> and I love the idea of doing it. I just want us to slow our roll and like look at everything. I'll look at all the sides of it before we do it. 
outside of the lab. Yeah, yeah. I'm fine with continuing to do it inside the lab in controlled scenarios. I want to get back to our idea of, of do animals have rights? And then we get to the question of ethically, is it immoral to, uh, to bring back an animal only to have it survive in a zoo? Is it immoral to create an, an, to create an animal for the purpose of imprisoning it? Um, I, I understand zoos as something to study animals and to, and, and to bring logic. But if you've got something that only exists as, uh, you know, as a prisoner, is, is, is that even ethical? Yeah. Yeah, so to the question of do animals have rights, um, we like to think of ourselves as these really highly evolved moral creatures. But I, I would ask you, in the history of human rights, name the group of humans who got rights by any other way than asserting and defending their rights. Oh, I, I, I would too, but I would also argue, uh, argue the thing. Show me the show me the animal besides man that ever argued uh, Socrates the cave the allegory of the cave yeah or Plato. So, so with that said, I, I would say uh, practically no animals don't have rights and they will not have rights until they evolve to a place that they can assert those rights or until it becomes advantageous for a, for man to argue their rights. So what you're saying is until we have Planet of the Apes, no. Yeah, and, and I think that's a, an immoral argument. I think it's a horrible thing, but I think a, a, a brief look at our own history uh, uh, shows that with without much contention on the yeah. on the matter. Yeah, and so I, I would hope we'd be better, but we're just we don't seem to be. We well, seem to be that shitty species. Just because they are determined not to have rights doesn't mean that it's then okay to do that sort of thing. Uh, does not make it okay to yeah, I, I, subjugate. I, I, I don't know. I don't know because honestly, I'm sitting here going, uh, would it be better to have a woolly, you know, a breeding pair of woolly mammoths in a Siberian zoo that was doing something to keep the species alive, or to have no woolly mammoths? Mm -hmm. To me, a pair, even in, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in imprisonment, is better than having nothing well and you, you can if you're going to make the argument for species that are now non-existent that once were existent why does the argument stop there what, what's the line that we don't say why not have species that never existed why not have two dragons and a thing or unicorns or, or hey, what, if you we know, could invent a dragon or a unicorn we would yeah, I, I I agree, but 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 we're, we're saying it like there's some kind of morality to the fact that it once existed and I think we are just fascinated by all the things we can make. I don't think there's anything deeper there or any... That's the wonder you know, argument, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and and I think if we could make dragons and unicorns or or any other beast that you I find in a Harry Potter up. story, I, I, you know? I would stand in line for tickets if they made dragons and unicorns. I'm, yeah. I'm just, I'll be honest. It's and, a and, narwhal and, and a horse. And, and I think it's, I think it's, it, I think it's, it's uh, philosophically wrong to be there. Yeah. And I would still be there. I would, would the go, dragon have to breathe fire? Yes. Okay. I would definitely go to medieval times more often if they had dragons there. Yeah, yeah. The ridden fair would be a whole lot more exciting. Yes. Uh, the last one uh, I want to talk about is political reasons. And this is one that I, I hadn't really considered before. But politically, the bad side of de-extinction is once we reach a point where we can t bring an animal back from from extinction once we we get to that point where it's it's economically feasible and possible extinction is no longer forever and mm -hmm. politically if you can bring the animal back if extinction is not forever why protect animals we can always bring them yeah. back uh, and i had i had never thought about that for well and before, what about but, when you get to the point where it is more economically reasonable to let it go extinct to not put all the efforts into preservation of it yeah and then, and then we'll just watch if. and if it affects the environment we'll bring it back if it doesn't yeah. then it didn't need to be there anyway exactly yeah of that's course. that's terrifying though that's terrifying to me of course i wonder if that would solve some of the moral dilemma of should we be bringing these species back because if the one of the arguments that I made earlier was 
you know, the the passenger pigeon. Kind of seemed like the sort of thing that was going to... Um, it was rats that, with that wings. That was going to, yeah, die yeah. off anyway. Um, on the other hand, we did see that they were apparently instrumental in the fertilization or the spreading of oak seeds. Uh, well, what did oaks do? No, it I wasn't forget. oaks. It was uh, it wasn't oaks. Crab apples was the big crab one. Apples. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, I had to think about that for a minute. You put me on the spot. <laughs> Don't do that. Yeah, but I really thought it was oaks. Not not the point here though. Um, but may have been oaks too. I read crab apples. Okay, that's but, the tree that we cut down that they tend to nest in. Um, but anyway, and so, and yet. We still have crab apple trees. Don't have very many of them anymore. Yeah, though. it we had don't a big have, effect on it. Yeah, we still have them. We don't have as many of them, and we can take that and measure it and say, "Is it worth it to have crab apple trees back?" I don't. Maybe it's because they have been kind of gone for so long that I don't see any need for us to have crab apple trees again. Yeah, part of me would really like to see that fourteen mile swath of birds. Uh, I want to be undercover when it comes over, but I'd like to see it. Yeah, yeah. Have like a clear umbrella that you can look up through. Glass ceiling. Yeah. Something. But but for that, I mean, it really sounds like you want a a, a, a photorealistic planetarium, not a yeah. not a species. I yeah, mean, we can develop VR. No. No, 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 you, no, you, no, you want to smell the shit I want, rising I want the from the grass. Experience. I do. I. Uh, <laughs> I can it's like it's that. like it's like I'd like to. I'd, I'd love to. I'd love to. To take a trip out and be in the ice and see a woolly mammoth, I, I, I would love to see an Ulrich live. There's if, if VR could get good enough, I'll, I'll use a ridiculous one. You know, the Matrix, and we plug into your spinal cord and give you the full experience. Does that solve it, or is there something about being there? No, no it doesn't solve it for me. Okay. Now, I'll, I'll say that now, but that's my understanding of, yeah. of technology. You know, yeah. I could be completely yeah. wrong here. The, we could all be living in a matrix. By the way, there's an episode on that somewhere. Yeah. It's behind the somewhere, paywall. Maybe. You have to. Uh, yeah, I don't even. Is it? I think to, we did it, it last year. No, we did it like the first year. I think uh, I no it's idea. been a while. Um, so this kind of covers this discussion of de-extinction. I'm just curious. Uh, quick round robin here. Uh, where are you on? De where where are each of us on distinction and the idea of bringing extinct populations back? I think we pump our brakes. We need to pump our brakes. Keep doing the research and, and working on it, but there is a lot of analysis that I think that we need to do before we actually start trying to bring extinct species back, introduce them into the wild, and cause the changes to the ecosystem. Okay. Yeah, I, I find an interesting paradox here that, that we create our own problems uh, when we do this, and that would kind of lend itself to your argument of pump the brakes. But it seems that, that necessity is the mother of innovation, that the problems we create lead us to better understandings, right? So there's this like th this necessary balance between full speed ahead and we get to learn everything and pumping the brakes, but we get to learn at a much slower rate mm -hmm. and responsibility. And I find it hard. I don't want a new killer bee out there. But on the other hand, we've learned a lot from, from killer bees and, and what we can do. Yeah. No. Well, and if breaking up the permafrost is so damned important, why don't they have like... Guys with hammers. Like steamrollers. Because that creates other problems. Okay. Yeah, I mean, probably... We're, we're talking about global warming here. It's probably going to... steamrollers don't shit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> they don't shit. Okay, so the shit is necessary. And they make I'm a saying, lot of carbon dioxide. Yes. Well, and, and my argument is, okay, fine steamrollers, but... There hasn't been, it hasn't seemed to have been enough of a problem. I love her solution other... involves shoveling coal into the back of something to, to, to roll through it. That's, that's amazing. Solar steamrollers. <laughs> we need Not solar steamrollers. The point is, if it's such a fucking problem, why is this the solution that we've gone with? Because it's a natural solution. Because we get the ball rolling, and the idea is that it it's was a, a natural solution. I don't know if it is. It was at one point. Oh, okay. The, the thing is, what we really need to do is find something that doesn't use fossil fuels that can replicate itself repair itself, keep itself going, and do that. And the best thing we have for that is it's animals. The woolly mammoth, yeah. yes. If you make we have animals, but not necessarily the woolly mammoth is all okay. I'm saying. I'll tell you where I am on this because uh, 
I I am I am excited about it, and there's I, I think oh, yeah. I think the uh, the recent extinctions are something that we should really look at mm -hmm. at, at hard. I'd love to see the auric back. I'd love to see the uh, uh, Tasmanian tiger back. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd I'd even love to see a mess with the uh, the, the the passenger pigeon. Although I don't think it's going to be something that's that's efficient or effective. Uh, I'm a little more nervous about things like the woolly mammoth however it's it is nice that the woolly mammoth is uh you know uh in places that people don't live um uh, true cautious optimism is where i am yeah but that's i a good but, way but to I, describe but it. i do think i do think we should be we should be looking at it pretty serious maybe i'm um, a cautious pessimist no uh, may, maybe that's what it is all right so we've gotten through this one i want to talk about a uh a, a show that i'd like to suggest to everybody here uh doesn't relate to this episode but but if you're a uh a word geek like me there's a show out podcast out there called lexicon valley by john mcwarder that's a good one it's one of my favorite shows ever john mcwarder is a brilliant linguist uh he he, he studies uh the history of words and every week he brings us an episode where he takes a, a takes a deep dive into usually one small section of of language and it's amazing what you can learn about uh, but where our language came from. <coughs> He's entertaining, uh, and if you're a geek like me that likes Broadway, he always manages to slide Broadway songs into there and also. Nice. It's kind of cool. John McWhorter's Lexicon Valley uh, it is my suggestion. Uh, if you have not uh, subscribed to us, you need to go ahead and uh, jump down there. And w Where would that subscribe button be? Well, it depends. I mean, if you're on a podcast, it's probably the same below, above. Uh, YouTube, it, it's got, there's two things you need to do on YouTube. There's a subscribe button right below the video here. And then when that, when you click that, a little bell is going to appear. Ding, ding, ding. The subscribe button is only going to help you if you log into YouTube and see our stuff come up. But the bell is going to actually give you a notification. Send you notification. <laughs> that, that we're on. And we will not drive you crazy with notifications. The other thing that you might consider subscribing to, if you're interested in any of the stuff we're talking about, and want to get more info as well as some fun philosophy stuff here and there, go to our website, www.sixpackphilosophy.com, and you'll get a pop-up to join our newsletter. We sent out this week's late. Uh, well, I say this week. So this is coming out like in three weeks. So we sent out the we first, sent out our first one late. Our first one late. Sorry, Oops. guys. We're going to try and do better. But that we're planning on that coming out on the Fridays after the show goes out. And it will have additional info for you. So you should have had a chance to listen to the show. I want you to and know. If you want to follow up, you can. I want you all to know that back to my Broadway, uh, according to Auntie Mame and Mame, a princess is never late. A princess is always perfectly on time. So that it did not go out late. It just went out on time. So are you time. saying you're a princess? I'm not the one that put it out. I'm saying that Anastasia is a princess. Oh, okay. <laughs> Why can't you be a princess? Because I don't, I'm a crane operator. I don't know can't how to. I don't know how to send the newsletter out, so it didn't work. Um, well, that that's where we are then, right? That is where we are. Sounds yes. good to me. All right, thank you guys so much for tuning in. We've had fun this week, and I hope you have too. We'll see you next week. Cheers. Cheers. Six Pack Philosophy is supported by independent philosophers just like you. If you would like to support us, go to sixpackphilosophy.com and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.